So we're talking through uh, John, John chapter 9, and kind of picking up where we left off last week. I didn't get to finish the message that we were uh, preaching last week. And, uh, you know, John chapter 9, Jesus heals the blind man, okay? And, the, and, the, and I'm just going to kind of go through it to kind of bring us up to speed where we're at. And, and we're, when Jesus healed this blind man, his disciples had asked him, who sinned? Him, you know, did he sin or his mother? Well, how could he have sinned? He was born, he was born blind. But Jesus said that the, that the glory of the God, the, the, that the glory of God would be fulfilled in him. Okay? You know, we, we look at our lives and we, we think about the situations and, you know, you know, I'm in my 50s and, you know, it's been a roller coaster ride for me. And, and I'm sure every single person in here, things have happened that you never expected happened. You know, good things have happened that were a blessing. Bad things have happened. But you know, God has us. God has, can, has us right where he needs us to be. And as we go through these things, as we go through these things, he can teach us like no one else can teach us. Why, does he, why can he teach us though like no one else can teach us? Because he knows us. He knows us better than ourselves. He knows how we're wired. He knows what's going to teach us. He knows what's going to bring us to that place. Because he has your eternity. We're eternal beings. And if we don't recognize this, think about this. If we don't recognize that we are eternal beings, and our eternity started when, when our mothers gave birth to us, okay? We were going to spend eternity somewhere. So because Jesus Christ had mercy, showed mercy on us, and called us into the family, called us into the flock. Now we're going to spend eternity with him. We're going to spend eternity where we, we are all born eternal. Praise God for that, absolutely. And, and because of his grace and his mercy, so, and he cares about, he cares about every detail of our life right now, and, and, and you've got to see that. You have to see that. He gave us the, the word of God, the, the scriptures, to lead us through that, to teach us, to guide us, to direct us, that we would put on the mind of Christ. And, and why do we need to put on the mind of Christ? Because listen, we're, we're living in flesh right now. We're, we're living in a world that's, that, we're, that our, our spiritual man is somewhat hindered because of the flesh, because we still have the fleshly desires that war against the spirit, that war against the spirit. So, so that is on purpose. You understand because nothing strengthens us more than opposition. Opposition is the only thing that can strengthen men, Olympic, Olympic gold medalists, or Olympic people in the Olympic. Think about the life that they, they lay down their life and they train endlessly to build their body up to compete in the Olympics or any athlete. We were watching a, we were watching a show. It was a uh, we were watching 30 for 30, and it was on a, on a, one of the players, the captain of the players for the Boston uh, hockey team. And he gets out and he plays, he plays hockey, he, he finishes up the season, they lose, this is when they lost to St. Louis. They, they get off and he goes back to Czechoslovakia and he's training, he start, immediately starts training for the next year, like no break, no, no break. He starts training for the next year. And, and I caught something and he said, you know, when he grew up, that was a communist country. They weren't allowed to work. They buy jeans. And, and they were so they were so poor that because it was a communist country, communism brings poor, it makes you poor, it makes us people poor. That's all it'll do. It'll make us poor. When they would win a tournament when they were kids, they would win a can of coke. That was it. That was all that they wanted. And that was like a big deal for them. That was a huge deal for them. And but my point is, he trained, and he trained, and he trained, and he never stopped. So God has us in training. Everything that goes on in our life, it's an opportunity to glorify God, or an opportunity to glorify the flesh. Think about that. It's an opportunity to glorify the Lord, or an opportunity to glorify the flesh. It depends on where our heart is. And where our mind is. That's why when we ask Jesus Christ to come into our heart, we ask him to come into our heart to be our Lord and Savior. And what does Lord mean? Think about what Lord means. If, if you rent a house, if you rent a place, you have a landlord. You, as long as you pay the rent, as long as you can, you, as long as you can 
and occupy that space as long as you want to, as long as you abide by the contract that you sign. Why? Because you have a landlord. It's not your house. You cannot remodel it. You cannot add on to it. You cannot do anything to it because you have a landlord. It's not your house. When we asked Jesus Christ to come into our heart to be our Lord and Savior, we gave up possession of our life. That's what asking Him to be Lord. And you know the beautiful thing is? He picks us up, He dusts us off, and He gives it back to us. Yeah. He gives it back to us. And He said, this is my way, walk in. This is my way, walk in. And as we read the Scripture, as we go through the Scripture, that's the renewing of the mind. And the mind's being renewed. So you look at, you look, and I really want you to see this, everything we do is training. Everything we do is in the pursuit of God bringing us, bringing, taking that, taking that old lump of coal that we once were and making a diamond out of it. How does it, how does a lump of coal turn into diamond under pressure? It's pressurized. That's the only way that coal will ever turn. Did you realize that the, that the diamonds come from coal? It does. Under pressure, under extreme pressure, that old, lump, that old lump of coal will turn into a diamond over the process of time. So God brings us through situations. We may not understand it. We may never understand it until we, get, until we stand in front of him, until we're talking to him. But I will guarantee it. He says, I know the plans I have for you. Yeah. Jeremiah 29, 11. He says, I know the plans that I have for you. They are good. They are good and not evil. So our perspective, that's why I was saying before, if I, we keep our perspective on God has our best interest at hand, when bad things happen, when bad things happen, then they're going to happen. How do we know that? Because he says, in this life, we're going to have tribulation. Right? How, they, how does he know that? Because he went through tribulation. Yes. He went through tribulation. He didn't leave us. He didn't just point the finger and say, this is going to happen to you. He himself went through it. He himself walked through the suffering, the persecution, the rejection of, of, of everybody in Israel. He loved Israel. He loved so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He gave Jesus, or God gave his only begotten son. But he gave himself for the nation Israel at the time, before the Gentiles come in. And they persecuted him for it. That's what got us on, that's what got me on John chapter 9 right now. Because we see the persecution that was still going on. And it wasn't just with Jesus himself. It was with humanity. It was humanity because the religious system, the religious system will always persecute. It always persecutes. It always tries to hold down. So John chapter 9, Jesus heals the blind man. Okay, he heals the blind man. They take him into the, they, they take him into the temple. He goes into the temple and the religious leaders... The religious leaders, they, they didn't believe him. They actually called his mother. They called his mother and his dad to say, hey, was this, uh, was he born blind? Was he born blind? And, and they were so afraid. Listen, they were so afraid. Instead of being, I want to say it like this, instead of them being joyful that their son who was blind is now healed, Okay, they were afraid to say much because they were told there was already decreed that anybody who, who claims Christ would be excommunicated from the temple. Like, listen, you claim Christ, you're done. You're not coming in here anymore. That's why when, when the apostles were, were taking up an offering everywhere they went, every single place that they went, they were taking up, off, and taking up an offering because of the, the poor saints that were in Jerusalem. They weren't poor prior to this. When their confession of Christ, they got removed from the temple. They got removed, they got excluded from the temple. They were no longer to worship with him. They were no longer to go in there and, and, and worship in the temple. And, uh, Squirrel Hill, 
You go to the squirrel hill, you don't know what I'm talking about. And he asked him, and he was carrying a conversation on him. He says, hey, what do you think about Jesus? What do you, what do you, and he was just a conversation. He said, what do you think about Jesus? You know what they said to him? We hate him. That's what they said. We hate him. Because he defiled the temple. So I'm not what we're what we're reading, what we're reading is relevant. What we're reading is relevant. And the way society is moving, the way society is moving, it's moving into a more atheistic type of a mindset. It's that's that's the kind of way the culture of America is moving into. It's not just the religious people, it's it's a lot of people in general. That they're moving into the place like, who are you to tell me what to do? Who are you? What makes you? What makes you judge? What makes you able to judge me? I don't. I don't want to get into that. So John chapter nine, Jesus healed this guy, and his mother and his dad were so afraid because they wanted to be excommunicated. So Jerusalem, when on the day of Pentecost, when these people got baptized with the Holy Spirit. Start speaking in other tongues. There was 15 nations that, that were represented in, in what they were saying. There was all these multitude of people that were in Jerusalem because it was one of the feasts where all the men of the men of Israel came into Jerusalem to worship, and they recognized it. So what happened was they these people, bunch of people got excommunicated from the temple. So if you were renting your house, maybe you worked for somebody, maybe your your livelihood was connected to somebody in the temple. When you got disconnected from the excommunicated from the temple, you lost everything. You lost your you, you lost your housing, you lost your livelihood, you lost absolutely everything. But let me tell you something, that's the power of God that a person would do that. Because that's the power of God in a person. Because listen, we're pilgrims and sojourners passing through here. This life is not our own. This life is not our home. We're just passing through this time. We're occupying until he comes. And when he comes, he's taking us with him. And we're going to live in glory. For, we're going to live in glory for the rest of eternity. So this life that we go, this life that we're living in right now, is all part of the process. It's all part of the time. Because if it was only about going to heaven, Jesus, we, we, we could have died. It could've, we could have died when, Jesus, when we got saved. Right? If that's all it was, we could have just fell over dead right there. It went right into heaven. It's not about just about heaven. It's about existing and making an impact on the world around us because we are the hands and the feet of Jesus. And then we're, I'm going through this story because I'm going through this story because I really feel led by the Spirit of God because there needs to be a, an understanding of false teachers. There needs to be an understanding of when somebody comes in and tries to spy out your liberty. They don't have to necessarily come into here. They can come into you, they can come to you, and they can start talking to you. And it's a manipulation. They start manipulating the words that they're saying to you. And, and, and let me tell you something, it will always appeal to your flesh. What is the flesh? What is the flesh? We live with, we, we live with the flesh. It's the humanistic side of us. It's the human side of us that is always warring against the spirit. It's always warring against the spirit. Now, don't get me wrong, the flesh, is we still live out of the flesh. We still have to exist when we go to work. We still we're still going to work. We still have bills to pay. We still so there's a certain part of our life that we're living in the flesh, and it's, it's we're living through the flesh. But Jesus wants us to live with the perspective of heaven, with the kingdom perspective. From the kingdom perspective, that everything in life, He says, it says, be not conformed to this world. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind, and you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You see, when we we live in this world, we live with, we live from the perspective of the flesh. We're going to make fleshly mistakes. We're going to make wrong mistakes. But when we're living in this world, we're living in this time from the perspective of the kingdom, from the perspective of heaven. In other words, running everything through the eyes of the Lord, running everything through the perspective of God's word. Listen, here's what's going to happen. We're going to love one another. There's going to be unity with one another. There's not going to be there's not going to be division. There's not going to be strife. Why? Because God is not strife. God is not division. God is unity. God is love and God is peace. When I say 
We need the peace of God. The only peace that we're ever going to experience, true experience, true peace that we're going to experience is the love of Jesus Christ in our hearts, letting him lead and guiding our lives. And when we allow him to when we allow him to guide our lives, see, we still have our free will. So we make the choice whether we're going to allow him to do it or not. We still have a choice in the matter. That's why he said, surrender your life to him. Lay it down. Lay it down. Lay it down. And let me tell you something. You'll have the best life. You'll have the best life. I got saved when I was 30 years old. Our whole family got saved. But Gloria and I, the kids, got saved around the right time. I'm going to tell you something. I wasn't living. I was existing. I was existing. That's what life was. It was, a, it was just a, an existing. I, I existed. I got up. I went to work. I was blessed. I thought I was blessed. I got a job. I was paying the bills. Everybody was out being healthy. You know what I mean? Everything was good. But I was still existing. It was when Jesus Christ came into my heart to be my Lord and Savior. When he called me, when he called me, called my family, that's when true life began. And that's what he wants for the world. That's when our peace Happened. That's when the when the true peace. We weren't even. I wasn't even. I didn't. I wasn't in jail. I was conversion. I wasn't a conversion because the bottom fell out of my life. It was not a situation like that. I was existing. I was getting up, going to work every day. The bills were being paid. Life was okay. I was an alcoholic, but life was okay. I could excuse anything away. I could justify anything I needed to. That's the flesh. That's what the flesh will do. Justifies everything. That's why we need the Word of God. Because when we run it through the perspective of the Word of God, it shows us who we are. You see, Jesus didn't deliver me from the hand of the enemy only. He delivered me from me. My thinking. Why did He, why did he have to deliver me from my thinking? Because my thinking was in, my thinking was in line with the enemy. My thinking was in line with, with the sin nature. When I say again, I'm talking to sin nature, that sinful part of me. My thinking was, was shaped by that. And I'm going to deal with that until I put on, and until, until Jesus Christ takes us out of here. We're all going to deal with a certain level of flesh. But it's up to you and I how much we're going to deal with it. Because listen, he said, when he said, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed. By the renewing of your mind, and you may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. It's up to us. God turned it over to us. He died on the cross. His blood was shed for you and I. His blood was shed. His blood covered our sins, covered everything and everything past. Everything past. It's up to you and I what we're going to do with it. How we're going to walk in that. Are we going to walk through the lens of Christ? In the, in the kingdom, or are we gonna are we gonna live through the, the through the lens of the flesh? So we see the we see the Judaizers. That's who that's who the religious leaders were at the time. The Judaizers were the ones who had him uh, had this gentleman under interrogation. That's really what he was. He was under under the interrogation of the of the Judaizers. I think I picked up a John. Verse 24, I, I, I'm just going to pick up where we left off last week. It says, so they again called the man who was blind and said to him, Give God the glory. We know that this man is a sinner. What they were doing, they were setting him up. They were setting him up. Because in Joshua chapter 7, verse 19, it says, Give God, give God the glory, which is equivalent to swearing to tell the truth. In other words, if they can get him to say that, and I meant that he understood this. He understood this. You know what amazed me the most about this whole story? Is the wisdom that this blind man had. Yes. The, the blind man had more wisdom than the religious leaders. Think about it. He had, he had absolute more wisdom than the leaders. He understood exactly what they were coming from. And we can see it from the next verse. And he answered and said, whether he is a sinner or not, whether he is a sinner or not, I do not know. One thing I know is that I was blind and now I see. Amen. See, he knew that they were trying to connect and they were trying to set him up. And all he was saying, I don't know this guy who healed me. I don't know whether he's a sinner or not. But one thing I do know, I was blind and now I see. Amen. And that was the story of our lives. Yes. 
That's the exact story of our life. I don't know what happened to me when I went to that church in 1997 in Galvin Sunnyside, Riverside Tabernacle. I don't know what happened to me, but let me tell you something. I walked out of there a different man. Amen. I walked, amen. 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 Praise God. I couldn't explain to you the whole details of, of the spirituality of Bob. I couldn't tell you that. All I knew is I come out of there a different person. And, and praise God for it. Praise God for it. But you see, they, they just kept drilling this guy. Verse in John 9, 35 through 41 says, Jesus heard that they cast him out. And when they had found him, he said to him, Do, do you believe the Son of God? They excommunicated him. And what was God doing? What was God doing here? God was showing mercy on him. Understanding that he was he was done. Like he was never going to go back into that, never to go back into that temple. So I, I didn't do the history on this, but I think the blind blind men, I know the main, the, the lame couldn't go into the temple, but I don't think the blind men either, I, I think they were considered lame. I don't think they were allowed to go into the temple. I'm not 100% sure, don't quote me on that. But if they had if they had physical impairments, they were not allowed to go to the temple. So that's why these people sat outside the temple and begged. So this man, this is what I'm saying, this man had a wisdom, a godly wisdom, that the religious people who taught people, who taught them. So just because somebody's a teacher, okay, listen, there's a whole bunch of head knowledge in teaching. I'm not, not saying anything about education, not at all, not at all, I'm not, don't, don't get me wrong. But when it comes to the things of God, it's spiritual. It's a hundred percent spiritual. And you could have a doctorate, you could have a paradox, you could have a, a you know, you could have four doctorate degrees with your education in, in Christianity and the things that does not make you. God shows the foolish things that confound the wise. Yeah. This blind man who sat who sat at the temple, who sat there and begged because that was the way he existed in life, had more wisdom, had more godly wisdom than the religious leaders that were trying to accuse him. He's, in other words, what he did is he seen behind what was going on because the wisdom of God gave him the instruction, gave him the, the insight for what they were doing. How did he know Joshua chapter 7 verse 19? How did he know that? That was godly wisdom. How did he know that they were trying to set him up with the questions they were asking him? Because it was godly wisdom. It was godly wisdom that this, that this man had. I don't think they had the real back then either. So he, he was absolutely blind from birth. So he was not reading the scripture. So any way he was ever going to learn is maybe his father coming home and talking to him about it. Just telling him all about the scripture. Just reading through. Reading through. And, and, and see, God had his hand on this young guy. God had his hand on him. Just like he had his hand on every one of us. And if you think about the situations and the circumstances in your life and how bad they really could have been, and how much the grace and the mercy of God kept us from the from the absolute worst happening. He brought us, he was drawing us, just like he was drawing this young man, because we know that he had his hand on him. He had his hand on every single person in this room. Every single person in this room he was drawing. Drawing us, drawing, that the Holy Spirit was drawing us to him. Verse 36, it says, And he answered and said, who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? Verse 37 says, and, I, and Jesus said to him, you have, been, you have both seen him, and it, it is he who is talking with you. Then he said, Lord, I believe. Amen. And he worshiped him. Amen. Amen. Hebrews 11, 11, 6 says, without faith it's impossible to please God. That's what this guy did right here. just exhibited faith. Lord, I believe you. Obviously, he had, he had that he was blind, and now he sees. But now he believed him. He believed in the Son of God, and this is what the people, this is what the people in the temple didn't want to happen. But God showed mercy on him because He knew He was going to be put out. He needed a family. Listen, we're in the world, but not of the world. Amen. We're in the world, not of the world. The world's going to reject us. The world is going to reject who we are. And don't take it personal, because they're not rejecting you, they're rejecting Jesus. 
They're rejecting the Jesus in you. That's why they've crucified Jesus. So if they've crucified Jesus, what are they going to do to us? They're going to be in opposition to us all the time. And we see that we see that more and more nowadays. We see it over in California that they're actually, they're not allowed to worship at all over there. Not not at all. They're they're completely completely stop worshiping over there completely. So I'm saying this. I'm saying this because they're, in, all, in this life we're going to have oppos opposition. But be of good cheer. Jesus Christ succeeded in the world. Jesus Christ overcame death. And how we know he overcame death because he was resurrected. When he was resurrected from the dead, that means that death couldn't hold, that could no longer hold him. So Jesus pulled this gentleman into the family, pulled him into the fold. Okay? And when he pulled him into the fold, he was adopted into the kingdom. He was adopted into the kingdom. Verse 39, Jesus said, For judgment I have come into this world, that those who do not see me see may see, and that those who, who see may be blind. Verse 40 says, And some of the Pharisees who were with him heard these words and said to him, we, are we blind also? And Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no sin. But now you see it. Now you say, We see, therefore your sin remains. That's, that's powerful. That's absolutely powerful. Let me read that again. Jesus said that if you were blind, you would have no sin. In other words, if you admit that you don't have nothing going, you don't know. If you just admit, I don't know, then you're not held accountable. But when you say you know, now, the Pharisees, they were the religious leaders of the time. They said that they knew. They were they were it. They were the, the happening thing going on. So what did that mean? That means that they were going to be held accountable for that. Because they said that they know. They said that they were the ones. They crucified the prophets. They crucified all the prophets. In, in, the book of, uh, in the book of Acts, when they were crucifying Stephen, I wanted to bring this out later on. Uh, In Acts, when they, when they were stoning Stephen, they killed, they, Stephen was telling them, he said, you stiff-necked and uncircumcised of heart. They killed all the prophets. The religious leaders killed all the prophets. They killed all the prophets that were coming to warn of the Messiah. Or not to warn, but just to tell people that the Messiah was coming. They, they crucified, they killed every single one of them. Every one, of the, every one of the prophets that went into Jerusalem that were led by God, they, they, they got killed. They, they were killed by the religious leaders. So, so listen, how did they know to kill the prophets? Because they were being convicted in their hearts so they knew. They knew what was going on. They were, their positions were being threatened. Their, their pomp was being, was being threatened. Their, their, their influence on the people was being threatened. When the Messiah had come, everything was going to change. He was going to be the king. He was going to be the one who was going to set the world free from. But they and, and the religious people didn't understand. They thought that their that their power was going to be eliminated. But was it eliminated? Was it eliminated? It was only eliminated because they crucified him. The powers of darkness. Because there were some of the Pharisees who believed on Jesus. There were some of the religious leaders who believed on Jesus. Joseph of Arimathea. You had Nicodemus who was a Pharisee. The Apostle Paul was a Pharisee. You had, all, you had a lot of people that were that didn't believe on Jesus. They didn't give all their name. But there was a lot of, lot of the religious leaders who believed on Jesus. And they were saved. They were saved. Jesus didn't come to destroy them. Jesus came to save them. But when we look at our life and we're hanging on to our life and we're hanging on to the old mindsets, we're hanging on to the life, what we think is life, and we reject Jesus, we reject him for being the Lord of our life. Listen, let me tell you something. He honors our free will. He honors, he allows, and, and he doesn't want us to, but no different than a, than a little kid. You tell him, don't do that. Don't do that. They're going to go do it anyway. And sometimes the best lesson is just let them get hurt. Let them, let them feel a little bit of pain for what they're doing. Sometimes that's the best teacher that there is. Not that you want them to. Not that you know. If you know they're going to get hurt, obviously you're not going to let them go get hurt. But as a result of them being disobedient to you, a lot of times they will just 
they'll, they'll fall under some mess. And a lot of times, they'll come back and they'll never do that again. Why? Because they know, they know what the road looks like down that way. The road you've been trying to keep them from. God's been trying to keep us from going down the road. Going down that road of our own mindset, our own leaning on our own understanding. He's been trying to keep us from doing that for all of our lives since we come to know him. Since we come to, to, for him to be our Lord and Savior. And he hasn't stopped. Even as we're Christians, that's why he wants us to be obedient to his word. He wants us to live in love and, 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 and be in him so we can love the world around us. So that we become appealing, so we're, we become that lighthouse that sits on a hill that draws people. we got to have something that draws people. And it's the a, it's a love and the light of Jesus Christ in you and I that's going to bring people to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Because listen, he uses us for mouthpiece, his mouthpiece. He uses us to preach the gospel. He uses us to witness the people. He uses us to love people. When somebody, when you don't have anything to say, just go wrap your arms around somebody and tell them you love them. It's okay. It's going to be okay. How comforting is that? How peace, how, how much comfort do we get from that? But that's what we are. But when we're being disobedient to him, when we're not listening to him, and not least leading him, letting him guide and lead us. We're never going to take heed to that. We'll miss it every time, unfortunately. John chapter 10 says, Most assuredly, I say, I say to you, He who does not enter, enter by the sheep, by the door, but climbs up some other way, is a thief and a robber. Jesus is the only door. John 14, 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes, comes to me, comes to the Father, but by me. So Jesus is the door of the sheepfold. Now, the sheepfold was basically, you know, like a corner like this right here. And there would just be sticks. Like, they just go up on a makeshift fence all around them. There was no door on them. They didn't put any door. They didn't put any gate like, like you see with the cattle holders, you know, the cattle uh, stables. And the sheep would go in there. The, the, the shepherd would put the sheep in there at night. Okay? And nobody got into that sheepfold but him. He would be, he was actually the door. A lot of times he would sleep in front of the door. Because this way here, he knew what was going on. And the sheep and the goat would, the goats would be in there together. The sheep and the goats would be in there together because a lot of times the, the, the goat herder, he had more than sheep. He had his goats. So they would kind of hang out together. They would just put them all in there. And, and at the time that he talks about, he talks about in, uh, Verse 2, it says, But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. The porter, there's a part of the scripture that talks about the porter opens the door. The porter represents the law. The porter represented the law. Okay? The law, Jesus Christ fulfilled the law. Jesus Christ was the fulfillment of the law. Okay? So the porter, in other words, the person who guarded the gate was the porter. In other words, the, the, the part of the part that the brought Israel should have should have brought them up to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ was the law to bring them to that, and it kept them within kept them within guidelines because they would have they would have just went like the rest of the heathen nations that have been on all the idolatry and, and, and all the sexual sin, all the the the, the bait killing the babies, all that like the, like the heathen nations, like the heathen nations they worship their they uh, they sacrifice their children. Some of them did. So when Jesus came, he became the door. He slept, he, he stayed in front of that door. Now, he couldn't keep the sheep in there that long because the sheep would get tired. Think about this. They would be in there, they'd be in there, they'd all walk away, but they'd get tired of being in there. So the shepherd would have to let them out. And he'd take them out and they would go out and graze. But the goats, the goats were the stubborn ones. The goats didn't listen. The goats had their own mindset. The goats had their own mind on, on what they were going to do. They were not going. They were not going to. It was really hard for them to listen to the shepherd. They had their own mindset. Let me tell you something. Don't turn into a goat. Don't turn into a goat. That's when we become stubborn. We become stiff-necked. We're going to do things the way we want to do it. We're going to do things how we want to do it. Nobody's going to tell us any different. 
Jesus said the sheep, his sheep know him. Right? His sheep know him. Verse 3 it says, To him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. He not only, they not only knew his voice, he called them by name. He called them by name. They knew their name. And what was crazy is the sheep were afraid of the dark. Think about that. They were afraid of the dark. So they needed the shepherd. They needed the shepherd. Even when the shepherd would take them out in the dark, they'd still be real skittish. They'd be real skittish. Why? Because when the predators would come upon them. But the shepherd, he would guard his sheep. This is in contrast to what we're talking about in John chapter 9. The story of John chapter 9 leads right into this. And Jesus is explaining this to the people. He is the shepherd. Hey, Jay, go ahead and play that clip. All right. He loved the sheep. He was not a hireling. The hireling gets paid to watch the sheep. So when danger comes, he don't have a care for the sheep. He doesn't have a concern for the sheep. Verse 4 says, and he, and he brings he brings out his own sheep and he goes before them. Follow, they go, the sheep follow him, and they know his voice. True shepherd leads the sheep, don't, doesn't drive them. You see, where he would go, they have, they don't know where the water is. They didn't know where the good pasture was. Jesus had the, or the, the he's given, using the illustration here, the shepherd had to lead them where the water was. The shepherd had to lead them where the good pasture was. And if he didn't do that, they, they wouldn't find it themselves. The, the scripture talks about us being sheep. We're the, we're the sheep of his, of his pasture. We're the sheep of his pasture. So when Jesus leads us, we're able to go in and out. And we're, we're, we're to have that rest. You see, the sheep that were in the sheepfold, they would get tired from being here. I think it was more stress. I think it was more of a mental stress than anything else on them. It would really tire them out. They'd have to get out. They weren't supposed to be caged up. They'd have to get out. Listen, you and I are not supposed to be caged up. You and I are not supposed to be confined by the, by the sin and darkness in our life. We're not to be confined by that. That's exactly what sin and darkness will do to you and I. It confines us. Jesus, I've come to give you life and life more abundantly. He wants us to have that pastor. He wants us to be able to come in and out. Where he shows us, he wants us to come in and out so he can lead us and guide us. And we have good food. We have peace in our heart. Verse 6, it says, and he used the illustration. I'm sorry, verse 5 it says, and, and they will by no means follow a stranger, but will follow him. They do not know the voice of a stranger. Talking about the religious leaders. Talking about the false shepherds. Talking about the, the, the false messiahs. You see, there was a reason that Jesus, if you ever read the scripture, there was a reason, if you ever wonder why Jesus would not just come out and say, I'm the Messiah. Right at first. He did it after a while. He had a certain amount of ministry to do before he did. 
he did say, yes, I am him. And who was the first one he said it to? Anybody know? It was the woman at the well. It was a, it was a Samaritan woman at the well. That was the first one that he, who had, a, who had a sketchy background. You know what I mean? He come to seek and to save those that are lost. Not one of us. Not one of us are in, 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 in a good position prior to coming, prior to Jesus. We all have need of a, we all have need of a savior. But this woman had a sketchy background, but he came to her and he revealed himself to her. But the reason that Jesus didn't reveal himself to her, to anybody prior to that day who would not come out and say who he was, was because there was many false messiahs who came in. And it was an absolute death sentence. If he would have said he's the Messiah, if he was the Messiah, he had to do ministry before him. Because listen, it was they would have cut him off, they would have crucified him before he had time to do anything. Because that was raising up an insurrection in the town. And, 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 and they couldn't, the, the Roman leaders were in that town to keep the peace. And anybody who, there was a lot of people that, that gathered out people and caused up a, a, a disturbance in the city. And most of the disturbances that they caused in the city was to rebel against the, the, the Roman Empire who, who had governed them. So anytime any Messiah would, would come up, they would just kill him. They would do away with him. Jesus understood this. So he was doing ministry. He was doing ministry. So in other words, he was there, he was showing signs and wonders of Isaiah 53 to show them, to show the religious leaders, this, I'm real. I am real. He was showing them through the scriptures, through what he did, through what he did, he was proving to them before he even said anything with his mouth. He was proving to them of who he was. And that's why they didn't crucify him right away. That's why they didn't do this to him right away. Because they understood exactly who he was. They understood exactly who they were. Because listen, they taught Isaiah. They taught the book of Isaiah. They taught the book of Ezekiel. They taught the book of Jeremiah. They taught these books. They taught the law. They understood what the Messiah was going to do. What he was going to look like. You want to read him? You want to read him? Uh, it's in Ezekiel chapter 4. Read that. It's, it's about the shepherds. It's about the shepherds. It, it goes through. It goes through the shepherd. Like God talking about the shepherd. In other words, he was talking about, he was talking to them about the false shepherds in Israel. They understood exactly what Jesus was saying when he was saying this. Just like no different than the, the Pharisees tried to, tried to get tried to trap that guy, the blind man. They tried to trap him by saying, praise God and tell us the truth. He knew what they were doing to him. No different than Jesus knew what they were doing to him. And he would just pull out scripture. He'd pull out scripture that they knew. And he knew, and he knew that they would verify who he was. Listen, Jesus come to save those, to save those that are lost. He come to rescue us. From the hand of the enemy. Verse 7. Jesus said to them again. Most assuredly I say to you. I am the door of the sheep. All who ever come, come before me. Are thieves and robbers. But the sheep do not hear them. That's what I was talking about. The many false prophets and messiahs and teachers. John 10 27 says. My sheep hear my voice. And the. And and none and know them, and I know them, and they follow me. He said, I am the door. If anyone entered by me, he will be saved and, and will go out, will go in and out and find pasture. The only salvation, the only salvation by faith in Jesus Christ, pastures for grazing, food, and rest. Let me ask you a question. Does it seem like your life is in turmoil? Does it thing, seem like things in your life, situations in your life are in turmoil? Maybe they're, maybe they're, you know, you know, out here. Maybe they're not absolutely personal. I mean, like right on you. But maybe there are situations around you that are in chaos that you can't kind of get a grasp on. You can't get a hold on. That's what Jesus comes to say. That's why he wants us to take us out into the pasture. He wants us to feed. He wants us to rest. He wants to love us. He wants us to be strengthened so we can speak into those situations. So we can show a love like, like we have no ability to shape. 
Because let me tell you something, in this life, there's trials and torments and, and, and there's a, a rush. You know, there, you know, think about the number of people with anxiety right now. Have you ever heard of so many people with anxiety in the time we're living in? Even before COVID, even before COVID, there was anxiety was astronomical. Why does every single, why do most people have anxiety right now? Because their life is spinning out of control. And they're trying to hold on to it. They're trying to grasp it. They're trying to make sense out of it. They're trying to stop it themselves. But I heard that I said like this, flesh can't help flesh. The spirit is what helps the flesh. The spirit is the only thing that can take care of that flesh. The spirit of God is the only thing that can take care of that anxiety. And when we when we continue to do it the to do it the way of the flesh, it's only going to get worse. It's only going to get it's just going to get out of control. Why do you think they legalize marijuana? Most people with most people with severe anxiety, marijuana the, is what they use. It's a drug. It's a drug. Jesus is not a drug. He is our peace. And he wants to heal us. He wants to deliver us. And if we would turn it over to him, if we would just allow him that opportunity, if we allow him to turn it to, to give up, give him that opportunity to heal us and put our faith in what he can do. Listen, he healed the blind man that, the, that, that God would be glorified. We're reading this, we're reading this scripture. We're reading John chapter 9, John chapter 10, up to verse 10. Jesus not, he said, the thief come not to kill. The thief come, does not come but to kill, steal, to kill, and to destroy. Jesus, I have come that they might have life, and that they may have it more abundantly. God wants us to have that abundant life. He wants us to have that abundant life where there's peace, where there's love, where there's joy, the fruit of the Spirit. You want to read John? Read, John, read Galatians chapter 5. Talks about the fruit of the spirit. Read Galatians chapter five. You'll see the fruit of the flesh, and you'll see fruit of the spirit. You'll see the contrast between the two. One has everything to do with us and what we're got going on and how we're living out of how we're living out of the situation. But the fruit of the spirit is Christ in us, and it's Christ in us is the hope of glory. It's the result of Christ in you and I. Amen. Amen. Thank God. Thank God for his peace. Thank God for his mercy. I want everybody to bow your head.